and Michael Remus. Hey, what's going on, everyone? And welcome to another edition of Winnipeg Sports Talk Daily. Huss and Reem with you for the next couple hours. And we've got a lot to talk about coming out of a, a very disappointing night at Canada Life Centre on a number, of, uh, a number of fronts last evening. Um... We'll get to this in a minute, but a huge, huge shout out to everyone that joined us for our first Winnipeg Sports Talk game for our four game pack. It was not the result we all wanted to see, but that certainly was great seeing all of you. We'll get to that in a minute as well. Um, we're going to have Murata Tesh jump on the program a little bit later on. Practice is just finishing up as well as we're going to get some availabilities and hopefully an official update from Rick Bonus on the status of Gabriel Velarde who was unfortunately injured in last night's game and, you know, certainly a turning point in the game last night. Um, the team with a real strong first period, um, but losing Velarde in the way that it uh, that happened, um, you know, I think, you know, certainly challenged the Winnipeg Jets, a uh, rotating cast of characters on the first line, as well as a number of other lines because of that. And the LA Kings stepping up in the second and third period and really taking over that hockey game and uh, giving the Jets a little bit of that uh, tough Pacific Division style of hockey um, that they didn't really have an answer for. Um, and obviously, there was the crowd, uh, which was by far, to me, the most concerning part of the entire evening. Um, it was great that we had our crew there, but man, there was a lot of empty seats, and we're going to have to get to that as, uh, as well. Um, we'll check in with Ted Wyman, who's out of bomber practice today, as the Bombers are getting ready for the Edmonton Elks. And uh, lots going on with Hockey Manitoba as well. Um, we're going to check in with Bernie Reichardt towards the end of the program as well. Um, uh, WHL Cup coming up. We'll find out more about that and everything else that Hockey Manitoba has going on. We'll get to the cool bet lines, although a very slight um, night for NHL action. Uh, two games in the league, although we do have some playoff baseball to get to. Uh, but listen, I'm going to get Michael Rivas in here. I want to welcome everybody to the uh, to the chat. And yes, T. Will, it is on us for not turning the game around with a wave <laughs> coming out of 316 yesterday. I caught that one. Good line. Uh, but hey, big shout out to the sponsors that make this program happen each and every day. Our friends at Princess Auto, Cool Bet Canada, Consolidated Supply, Royal Sports, Boston Pizza, and Little Brown Jug, Vita Health Fresh Market, Wallace & Wallace, F Apparel, Nick & Nicky DQ, Modern Man Barbershop, Aquatech, Manitoba Battery Canadian Club and uh, I think we've got lots of fodder for a uh, a good why not question of the day for not Autocorp over at Waverly and McGilvery. Let's get Michael Remus in here and uh, Remo what's going on? Uh, I, you know obviously the game was uh, not the way anyone wanted to see but um, man it was uh, certainly started off great meeting all of uh, the WSDers in the uh, in the whiskey hangar outside section 316 uh, can't get over the great response we had for this pack and it was so much fun getting that crew together albeit the game didn't quite give what everyone was hoping to get when they got to the rink last night yeah the game started off uh on a great note with rick bonus well great note with uh, us at the whiskey hangar there and the you know 316 right outside it was awesome getting to meet so many people uh who got the ticket pack uh, people who fan of the show or thought it was a great deal but um yeah i had fun hanging out there and uh, then there was the game but uh the pre-game you know we had the early entry uh great location up there huh so you know the free urban's getting their free drink trying to work the uh, qr code from the app but once you got that all sorted out hey it was a great time you know it was um and 
you know, obviously we had everyone that had the tickets as part of our package. I mean, a bunch of other WS tiers that had tickets to the game, whether they're season ticket holders or mini pack holders, came and joined us as well. So it was uh, it was exactly what we'd hoped for, to be honest, when we put this together. And hopefully, this is something that we can uh, that we can grow uh, going forward. Um, actually, you can grab a couple of those picks just to just to show off. And and while we're doing this, I, I have to thank um, Emily and Dorian who have been working with us uh, on this. Um, they gave us some you know a couple of great things to uh, raffle off amongst WS tiers. And great congrats to the winners uh, of those items. And I also want to say, and again, this will sort of get into the conversation about crowds and where the fans have gone. Um, but a, a special note, listen, I know a lot of people at True North and in that organization over the last number of years, the, I mean, the organization's taken some heat on customer service and how they've handled ticket holders. Um, I, I have to give a hat tip to some of the people in the office. And I didn't even know that this was happening. Um, but obviously there were some questions about, you know, where, how does the drink work? The, uh, you know, your, the voucher in the app, how do you redeem it and all that. And a number of people told me that they had one or two calls from the office yesterday, um, to do that. So listen, it was, um, it wasn't the game that we wanted. Um, but we had a great crew. People were taken care of really well. And we can only hope that this is uh, the start of a bit of a turnaround because, Remo, we're going to get to the game in a minute. But I, I, I'll be honest. I'm usually I'm a little lower in the upper bowl um, in in that section. But you know, I was up at the top of our section there, and you saw those holes in the upper bowl and a few holes in the lower bowl as well. And I think a lot of people's fears about what had happened to the overall support for this team, the season ticket base. Um, listen, I know that the crowd was, you know, we talked about the home opener crowd not being where it was or where it should be. And that was sort of a topic on the weekend, but it, it, it didn't look like it did yesterday. And as much as we'll get to the game and obviously the Velarde injury was a huge, huge bummer. Um, to me, I mean, as someone that is from the city, that's had seats from the inception and I've said, I'm always going to have seats as long as we have a team. Um, I was absolutely rattled. Uh, at at the uh, at the crowd last night, and I know people didn't want to hear it in the off season when the Jets sort of started and kind of pulled back that campaign, you know, saying like we need to be in and around thirteen thousand season tickets to to make this viable long term. Um, to me, that was five alarms last night. If you're at the building and you looked around, realizing what has happened to, um, you know, what was one of the healthiest and most vibrant season ticket bases in the entire league, albeit in the smallest market. Yeah, I agree with you too. You know, you sat up there and here's uh Brent Bellamy's video on Twitter. Uh shout out to to Brent. Um here's here's the crowd. You can see the empty seats there and I agree. You know, we were up there at the top and um you know I remember sitting up there there, you know, the first few seasons sold out every game and but it was even on the lower bowl there were big empty sections and they had their big campaign and I don't know what the results of that were but it was the lowest it was it was the lowest attendance that they've had not counting uh games where the pandemic you know had res because restricted attendance because of the pandemic but uh, I think it definitely stood out to a lot of people there on the bright side us uh there was no lines for the bathroom or concessions for me uh, but uh, I mean over overall for the health of the franchise certainly not ideal when you're having your lowest attended game Ever. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and again, I mean, this is something that's come up, I think, intermittently over the last couple of years. And 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 I've been suggesting for a long time that there is somewhat of a reckoning coming for professional sports in general, uh, in and maybe in specifically the National Hockey League, because you know the NFL, the NBA. Um, even Major League Baseball, to a degree, you know, get so much of their revenue from streams other than than butts in seats. That's not the case in the NHL, and that's not the case here in Winnipeg with the Winnipeg Jets. Um, and we all know what has happened with the cost of of everything. <laughs> I mean, we can talk about the price of tickets, which has consistently gone up. 
as has the salary cap and the HRR numbers and all of that, but it's all been on the backs of the fans. And it's not unique to Winnipeg, but what is unique to Winnipeg is the 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 area that we've got here to to get fans, I mean to to draw crowds is a heck of a lot smaller than just about everywhere else in the National Hockey League by a considerable amount, which has meant that, you know, we kind of need everybody on board and everybody, I mean, everybody that is able. I mean, I don't have the numbers on, you know, what has happened, you know, to compare the average hockey fans' earnings right now to what they have to pay when we're talking groceries, running their car, you know, all the stuff that you need to have to live compared to 2013, 2014, for instance. And I'm sure it, it listen, I, I I can think I can confidently say it has not gone in favor of the consumer. Um, but at a certain point, these leagues and teams were going to tap people out. Now, I mean, we hear all of the sorts of things about pricing. I'll say this. I mean, it's still Nash, it's still the NHL. And I mean, I don't think it's possible to run a team in a smaller market in a league competing against Toronto and New York and Chicago and all these other teams and buildings and organizations and markets um, and expect to, you know, charge people half what they do in other markets. But it's quite clear that there's a myriad of reasons why. We were at a game last night with more empty seats than we have ever seen before. Um, you know, I think that there's there's some element of frustration with the team by part of the fan base over the last number of years that I think has sort of built up and that's contributed to it. And I'd love to say I'm coming on here with a bunch of answers. I mean, I've got a lot of experience in this field. Um, I mean, I spent a good portion of my life selling season tickets, whether it be for the Jets and 1.0 at the end of their run with the Manitoba Moose trying to build that franchise up to a point where it was viable to maybe get an NHL team, obviously for the World Women's Hockey Championship. So, I mean, I do have some experience in what it takes to get butts in seats. Um, I don't, People, a lot of people have asked me, what are they doing wrong? Like, I don't have enough, I can't speak to that. Because to be honest, I really don't know. Um, but like I said, when we were having this conversation, probably in the summer around when the Forever Winnipeg came out, I mean, you can not like the message, but I hate to tell you folks, that message is true. Like this franchise doesn't work long-term with 4,000 empty seats in the building. Um, I mean, that's just not... <laughs> I mean, at a certain point, it gets to be, what's the point? I mean, you're losing tons of money, uh, I would imagine. I mean, if that continued for an entire season, I'm sure it would be a bloodbath on the accounting pages. Um, and I mean, and that wasn't the way that it's been for a long time. So, I mean, listen, I don't think that it's a lost cause or anything like that. We're not counting down the days till they have to go somewhere else. But what I will say, that was a five alarm siren to the organization. Uh, I think to, to everybody in Winnipeg that is invested in having an NHL team here. And I think we all realize that, you know, this city is night and day. I mean, so much of a different place to live. For most of us, some people don't care. Some people, it's completely off the radar. And uh, I mean, I guess that that will be the case in every market. Um, but I know that there's some really, really serious conversations, I'm sure, going on within TN offices right now. And we're going to reach out. I'm, we're hoping to have somebody from management come on uh, maybe Friday to uh, to talk about where they're at, maybe to help reconnect with some of our listeners and people that for whatever reason aren't there. I get it that there's a lot of people that just simply can't do it. Um, but I think there's a lot of people that can that for a myriad of reasons were in on tickets beforehand that aren't there. And I think for the good of, uh, of everyone and this thing moving forward and Winnipeg staying and being around here for a long time as a member of the National Hockey League, some things got to get figured out. Some actions need to be taken and some improvement needs to be seen because that was, um, you know, as they say, the game and the disappointment of, you know, the was return and all of that, 
to be honest, was almost secondary to me, Reem. And it was so great to have that group that we were with yesterday because it really made me feel like, you know, there are so many people that care about this team and a lot of people that were in our group that aren't able to have season tickets, that aren't able to do a half season, but love the club, live and die with them every day or with us every day on the chat um, that figured, hey, this is a great way that I can sort of get in and get a piece of it and come to a game and come to some games with some other people. Hopefully we can grow that because there's a whole lot of growing that needs to happen right now with the uh, with the season ticket base. And I mean, there's two sides to it. And this is something that I can't speak to. I mean, I know a big part of it was trying to get into the corporate community and re-engage that group and kind of get our percentage of season tickets held by corporations closer to those of other NHL markets because it was way down. And that comes out of the, the drive to the drive to 13,000. So many of those tickets, companies that would have loved to have had them didn't get them because they were just picked up in a fair way on Ticketmaster. And then you've got groups of six and eight and 10 people that are sharing seats. And for whatever reason, you know, people move, things change. And all of a sudden those numbers come off the books. I mean, the corporate community has always been sort of where you start with your season ticket base. Um, so, I mean, I hope things can be done there to re-engage them and whether it's the uh, new messaging, the messenger, bottom line is it's going to take a lot of work and I think a lot of boots on the ground. And it's not a matter of a bunch of ads that are running on, you know, radio stations and televisions that get people to just go online and buy season tickets or even buy individual tickets. I mean, the hockey team has an element to it too, but I mean, I think that from a hockey team perspective, there's been, you know, some, there's definitely some advancement. I think some clear indications about where the team is going, some excitement about the young players in the future, some commitments to the team and players, as we talked about last week, that was very well received. But this is not an easy answer. But I think what is clear, at least to me, is that there's a ton of work that needs to happen. There's probably some things that need to be acknowledged, some actions that need to be taken to get some of these people that they have lost back behind the team and most importantly back in the arena yeah wow well well said hustler and you talk about individuals a number of tickets i know for me personally and i've talked to a couple other people a lot of people who are renewing their mortgages right now has my rates gone up like almost double i mean how much more money is that per month that maybe was disposable for entertainment purposes before now you know going for uh more of the essentials and talk about corporate support my i see you know mike mcintyre who wrote an article in the Free Press last November when the Jets couldn't sell out a a game against Montreal, which is a bit of a shocker. Um, and, you know, he retweeted that. Paul Friesen retweeting this. But Mike, Mike McIntyre reporting today, per our stories in April, 15% corporate support in Winnipeg, 45 to 85% corporate support in the six other Canadian markets. So uh, I'm not sure how you fix the issue, but it was certainly going around, not just in... In Winnipeg, you know, you're seeing people in chat saying, oh, you know, we're there. And, you know, definitely alarming, uh, the lack of seats. Um, but I think, you know, around the NHL, Buffalo as well, has, they had 66% capacity, uh, 12,600, uh, just under the Sharks as well. I mean, Sharks are a last place team. Uh, they had 10,378. But I think Winnipeg certainly uh, a unique market uh, compared to the rest of the league. And uh, this is going to be a story story all season i mean we you know, we wanted to, on monday we wanted to talk about how great the game was against florida how well the team has played but it was attendance dominating for, for like 40 minutes in the chat to the point where it's like okay relax but i mean after that tuesday game we'll see what it is thursday where you have the lowest attendance that you've had um since returning especially after you know the the campaign that was put out uh, last spring you know, a lot of people have, have opinions. I can see that. But that that campaign, like, I don't know if that even really got off the ground. Mm -hmm. I mean, they sort of put that out. There was all this pushback from people going, oh, my God, they're threatening to move the team. And, like, I came on this program and said, listen, I didn't hear, I didn't hear a lot of pushback from people that had seats. It was, it, like, all the people that I knew that had season tickets were like, no shit. You know, like if the if the fan base crumbles and there's not enough people in the building, yeah, like I mean, it wasn't direct threat to do it, but it was a reminder of where we've been. And this is the thing that rattled me the most. And I had a conversation with a good friend yesterday that is of my vintage that remembers 1.0 and that era. 
and again, early on in the 1.0 year, I was too young to really, you know, understand what was going on other than that there was a team here and it used to be in the WHA and now we're in the NHL and Wayne Gretzky was coming to town and all that. But I'm certainly old enough and was um, around enough to understand what happened in those final couple of years when the team left. And if you think about this, that was a 16-year period. I mean, 79 or 16, 17 years, whatever it was, from year one of the of the NHL moving from the WHA till the team moving to Phoenix. And I mean, I'd like to say, I was going to say, I don't want to set off any alarm bells. The alarm bells are already off. I mean, that the toothpaste is out of the tube. Uh, this is 2011, this team came in. It's 2023, 2024 right now. We're into year 12. Um, and again, there's a lot that goes into this. And it is something that you could talk for five to six hours. And I'm not sure you get any clear, unequivocal agreement on a lot of things. There's a lot of a lot of influences and a lot of factors. But it is eerily similar to where we were in the early 90s which preceded the team leaving um so again i'm not saying this is going to happen but i certainly think that everyone needs to wake up open up their eyes um and realize the situation that the team is in and govern themselves accordingly um i mean there's not much more to say than that other than it was uh it it, it is uh, it was the most shocking Shocking crowd. And again, like maybe this resonates with me a lot more having been through it the first time. Um, but listen, it was against all odds for us to even get a team back in the first place. And the honeymoon was incredible. And we had this great run. And I often think about the 2017-18 playoff run with just how crazy things were outside and what it did to the city but also how in a lot of ways it nearly bankrupted Winnipeg and a lot of people, you know, with the amount of tickets that they had through the playoff run, the cost, especially when we got down to the Western Conference Final, and maybe the most telling thing of it all, and this was the first sort of sign that I had of trouble, was the fact that that final game in the Western Conference Final wasn't sold out. Now, the NHL were setting the prices for that game, and it was, I mean, they were 350 400 $450, so... I mean, I get why that didn't work for a lot of people, and I totally understand why people that had been to a bunch of other games in that situation weren't there. And I always wonder what the Stanley Cup final would have been like if those tickets were even more on that, if people would have physically been able to make it to the games. Um, so pricing is part of it, but there is way, way more to it than that. I mean, we're still seeing big crowds for particular concerts when there is a demand to do it, and... Um, like, and again, I, I, I don't, I, there's probably a part of, I mean, there's a number of people that used to go to all the games like, ah, whatever. I'm just going to watch the game at home and whatnot. Like, I don't know. It, it is, um, it's so concerning <laughs> right now. Um, and obviously we're interested in feedback. The chat's going off right away. I may as well get to this right now. I mean, and I, and, and listen, we will and have already talked about what, I mean, the organization has done. Uh, the missteps that they've taken. I mean, as someone that has a pretty in, you know, a good background in how to take care of customers and season ticket holders, I think there were some big misses early on. Um, obviously, people have changed spots. There's new things, but when it comes down to it, um, you know, some of those things were mishandled. Um, but we're now at a situation where it is incredibly alarming, and I hate to tell you, folks. Uh, but we're going to get, I'll be at that game again tomorrow night. And for the weekday games for the foreseeable future, I'm not sure this is going to be that different. So if you didn't believe what you thought might be happening, uh, we saw it last night, like right in front of our faces. And if you weren't at the game, you saw it on social media and you saw people talking about it. And uh, I think we as a, you know, as a city, as a fan base, and certainly True North as an organization um, needs to needs to get together and, and, and try and find a way to not only stop the erosion of the fans that have left, but do what they can to get a lot of them that they've lost back 
Um, and I think there's going to be a lot of work to go on it. But um, I'll put this out for the why not question of the day for not Autocorp and Waverly and McGillivray. And if you, if you are somebody that had seats, maybe you were a part of a seat holder a group before, because I know there's a ton of you out there, or had your own seats and you don't have them now, you let us know why, or bottom line is, maybe not necessarily why, what could be done, what can be done right now to get you back in the building, to be more regular for an NHL team in Winnipeg. Um, because that's what I think everybody needs to know, and those are the actions that need to be taken to get this thing going back in the right direction and prevent another couple years of conversations like this and, God forbid, an end like we had the first time around. Well said, Hustler. Well said, and looking forward. A lot of people have thoughts and feedback, and this isn't something that's going to be a quick fix here. And, I mean, I will see what happens uh, for this year. I mean, that was a Tuesday game. I was surprised because, you know, we all the hype around here Luke Dubois, but we've got Thursday coming up with uh, with Vegas, defending cup champions. You know, a lot of Manitobans on the team as well, but... You know, maybe another test next Tuesday, a 745 start Huss against the St. Louis Blues on that night where the NHL has all the teams playing in staggered start times. So, um, yeah, I mean, we'll see, we'll see where it goes from here, but I think we've said what we need to say. Do you want to, I mean, we're 30 minutes in. Should we start getting to the game or do you want to get to oh, the Oh, yeah, big, the game. The game you, last you, night. You actually <laughs> want to talk about the game here or is this Winnipeg uh, attendance talk? Yeah, um, he, well, listen, I mean, uh, as I said, I mean, there was no way around it. Um, and and I think people would have been disappointed if I didn't get right into it. I mean, God knows I've been talking about this sort of thing, whether it being in this format or doing it for a long time. And um, as I said, it was impossible to get to anything else other than that game, uh, other than what was happening in the stands. That being said, for the game... Um, was an absolute it was an absolute buzzkill on uh, on so many levels. Um, Remus, we had, the, I mean, the Gabriel Velarde injury. You know, we were already yeah. kind of looking around the crowd, and you know, I'm sure everyone, or I'm certainly I was at least thinking about that quite a bit while we were watching the game. And I think that shock of the crowd took a lot of the air out of everything. Um, and then Gabriel Velarde, um, you know, got injured, and Remus, that looked. That looked like that could be something that, you know, could potentially end a season for Gabriel Velarde. Um, he was out, very quickly ruled out for the game. Um, we have just heard from Rick Bonus that Velarde is out four to six weeks. And to be honest, that, that to me, if you'd asked me this morning what the best case situation was, I would put it in, uh, in that four to six weeks because I was worried that it was going to be months and I mean, the worst case scenario would be this guy that's made such a great impact early on through the first two games in a period would be lost to them for the season. So, uh, listen, it's not good in the short term, but I guess could have been much, much worse. Yeah, um, it was, you know, I I watched this play. So, first of all, you know, the Jets, I thought, had a great start. A lot of chances. Kupari had a breakaway. Kyle Connor had a nice chance. And we all thought Morrissey scored. Uh, but he, you know, went to the replay and it somehow... Oh hit the crossbar and people were ready to go. I mean, the, the first game replay looked like yeah, it was in too. Look, like look, that completely screwed with all of us in our section last night. We definitely, uh, we definitely thought it was in. And also a shout out to Rick bonus starting, uh, Kupari, I and Velarde the game. I thought that was a nice touch as well. Starting those yeah. players against, <laughs> against their former team. He got off to a great start. People were booing, uh, Dubois, but yeah, that Velarde injury. And I've watched it so many times. He goes into the corner, and I don't know what Blake Lazat is doing there. Like, at first, I, you know, we're watching it real time in the stands, and I thought, oh, did he kick his leg out? Something with his stick got caught behind Velarde's leg. He fell backwards, landed on his knee, and you just heard Kirby Doc out for the season, ACL, MCL, and I agree, you're fearing the worst uh, for Gabe Velarde. And when Lazat got a tripping call, but... Velarde, they just announced, yeah, as you said, out four to six weeks, sprained MCL. That's best case scenario, uh, four to six weeks. So you're actually kind of relieved, but now they have a big hole, um, and they tried to fill it with moving Nemesnikov up there, um, you know, for the game. And uh, there's only so much you can do during a game trying to keep all the lines together. So you move up the fourth line guy, but they did, they put uh, Rasmus Kupari up there with Connor and Shifley today. 
at practice. Would you want me to go over the lines today or? Yeah, actually, yeah. Sure. Like, let's do that right now because we're going to get into all the stories around the, you know, the game last night mm-hmm. and where they go from here with Marat coming up in a few minutes. But uh, yeah, if you want to, uh, if you want to get that, uh, get that ready. Sure. Okay. Hold on. I'm just texting with Marat about when he's coming in. He's like, uh, he didn't realize that the coach. He said he was didn't realize the coach just finished, so he's going to come on. So I kind of. Sure. But um, here's the here's the lines: Connor, Shafley, Kupari, Ehlers, Perfetti, Nemesnikov, Ayafalo, Lowry, Niederreiter, Baron, Gustafson, Chisholm. That's because Appleton not on the ice as well. I I didn't see. I sec, j- say that again. Appleton. Is, sorry, Ayafalo, Lowry, Niederreiter. Yeah, Appleton wasn't there either. And I we've been doing the show, so I I haven't seen. No one in chat has said any uh, any reports on that. So we'll wait. And I'll just. Double check that. And then Morrissey, Demello, Sandberg, Schmidt, Dylan Pionk. So defense. I mean, I guess maybe switch around the bottom, bottom pairs there. But that's uh, that's what we're dealing with on the on the forward lines. But and then once you know once PLD scored, has uh, I mean the game totally turned and there's oh some affi- there's some officiating that was certainly questionable uh, in the middle oh, of that Cole game. Perfetti getting blasted right between the numbers, head first into the boards. Well, I think it started when Morgan Barron got a penalty for interference for hitting a guy who had the puck in his glove. I think it was Grenstrom. Like, well, I think that it, was the power play that turned into the PLD goal. Uh, yeah, and PLD's goal, you know, technically not a power play. It was like one second after it expired. You watch the the call on uh, on TSN. Dan Robertson's like, oh, and the Jets uh, managed to kill off the penalty. The Kings won't get a power play goal. Bang. PLD grabs a rebound in front and and puts it in, has a nice celebration, gets booed and um and yeah, and then but Perfetti and it's funny, I'm we're watching the I stopped watching the play there because the puck was nowhere near him. And then he got drilled from behind head first, and it's not boarding, which looked like textbook definition of boarding. So Sandberg has to go in. Or feels like he has to go in and fight and you know ends up taking two pretty big shots to the face. You know, gets what five out of ten and two minutes for instigating, which seems ridiculous. So uh, the game really well, turned on that as well. And, and I mean, just got absolutely plowed with two haymakers in the face. Um, sort of waiting for things to get going because the guy's stick was in between them. I mean, shout out to Sandberg for stepping up. This is a guy from college that I mean, he's a big, strong guy. I'm not sure he's got much of a fight card or fight record in the past. Um, and I don't know. I mean, some people I'm sure not pleased that maybe there wasn't any response afterwards when that guy got out of the box afterwards. Uh, but overall, just a real, really tough night for, uh, for the Winnipeg Jets. Listen, we're going to get to it coming up, uh, with, uh, with Murata Tesh in a few minutes. Uh, let me give a shout out first of all, to our buddy Julian, because Julian has already stepped up right away. All we needed to mention was Movember. And we're putting together the WST team, working with Modern Man to do it. And Julian is there. Of course, you know Modern Man has uh, you know, got eight locations now in Winnipeg, including the newest locations on Pembina and Plessy Road. Um, full, full variety of grooming services, including haircuts, beard shaping, shaves, color services, and more. You can book your look via modernmanbarber.com. Um, but we're also, uh, we're also a big, big supporter of Movember. Obviously, you have great shaves, cuts. You want to get the shave done maybe at the end of the month. Um, but yes, WSTers, if you're listening on the podcast and you would like to be a part of the WST team for Movember, let us know. If there's a few people in chat, T. Cone Apollo, you'd look great with a stash for the uh, for the month. Um, let us know if you'd like to join us. We'll get a few perks in it for you guys. Um, we'll follow your progress all month long. Um, and we'll certainly uh, be able to help raise some funds and support it here with our friends at Modern Man. So uh, Winnipeg Sports Talk at gmail.com. Let us know if you want to uh, join the cause in the WST team for November. Um, listen, pool season's done. But, you know, if you're thinking about taking the plunge for 2024, talk to the experts at Aquatech. What you might not know is that a whole home renovation start with Aquatech with thousands of rentals as their foundation. Aquatech can upgrade any space in your home. If you're ready to enhance your kitchen, your bathroom, or even add a man cave to your home, visit aqua-tech.ca to learn more about their whole home renovations, including financing options. Oh, we got another glorious day outside right now. This weather really is incredible. 
But I hate to tell you, that isn't going to be the case <laughs> for very long. Uh, winter is just around the corner. And are you ready for it? Uh, well, Manitoba Battery can get you ready for it. Make sure your car, your truck battery is good for the long Manitoba winter with free battery testing down at 1026 Logan Avenue. And if you are in the market for a new battery for your car or truck to get you through the winter, get the best prices in town, hands down, beating the pants off the big box stores and the best service while shopping local at Manitoba Battery. Just pop online to manitobabattery.com for all your battery needs. And the best part about it is you don't even need to leave your home because Donnie and the gang will deliver it to you for free anywhere in the city of Winnipeg for any purchase over 60 bucks. It is just that easy. You can give them a phone call to arrange as well at 783-8787 or pop down and see them in person at Manitoba Battery at 1026 Logan Avenue. Hey, a big shout out to our friends at Canadian Club as well. Getting ready for one more bomber regular season game on Saturday night against the Edmonton Elks. And of course, the uh, Canada's favorite Canadian whiskey will be well represented throughout IG Field as the official sponsor of the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. And in addition to all that CC flowing around the Rum Hut area and the stadium, don't forget CC and ginger available in 473 milliliter cans. Just absolutely delicious, not just in the summer, but anytime. And you can pick it up as well at your local beer store or wherever that sells great beer. All right, uh, Michael Remus, let's get back to uh, the game. Marat's going to join us a little bit later on. That hit against Perfetti was a big, big part of the game. We talked about the response from Dylan Sandberg. The instigator in the 10-minute misconduct that I don't think anybody liked or appreciated. Um, but overall, Perfetti had a, a bit of a tough night, certainly from a physical standpoint against a big team like uh, like uh, you know, L.A. And we'll get to that, you know, kind of how they move forward. I have to say that Nikolai Ehlers has struggled so far through three games. And maybe we shouldn't be surprised. I mean, the guy did basically miss all of training camp right now. But even with Velarde in the lineup, the way the first line was going and the way the third and fourth line goes, they absolutely need Nikolai Ehlers to be um, more the Ehlers that we've remembered the last many years when he's been healthy right now because it just has not clicked for 27 so far this season. Yeah, there was a lot of talk about that second line there with Perfetti and Niederreiter. And you know, even though Nino didn't score in that first game, he had like four chances early on. And what he had, had some chances in, in that second game as well. Nikolai Ehlers, what he had the bomb on the draw pass from Kyle Connor against Florida. But uh, you look at his numbers, a guy who's, they had it on the Jumbotron yesterday, the franchise leader in plus minus. Say what you want about uh, plus minus. What is he? Minus two, three in three games, zero points. I mean, you can say, you know, they've given up a ton of goals, which they have. And Hellbuck, you know, needs to be. You know, you need to see more of Rough the first Connor week for Helly. No way yeah. to sugarcoat that. Yeah, and to and uh, Mike McIntyre reporting, uh, Brossois will start Thursday uh, against Vegas. But yeah, you need secondary scoring. Um, you know, Mark Shafley scored in in three straight games. Uh, he's been great, but they need something from those guys. And you know, bit of a switch up here now. Uh, Nemestikov going that line. I think he might actually be centering with Perfetti going to the wing. And Ehlers, and you know, Perfetti's made some good plays, but uh, Nikolai Ehlers, man, he's been one of the best guys in terms of efficiency, scoring per minute. And you have to think, tr you know, the lack of training camp um, has certainly affected him out of the gate here. And you hope, you know, he's able to right the ship. I mean, great. He's usually close to a, a point per game guy in the last couple seasons, or just under. Yeah, um, and you know what? Maybe it's, and listen, this is if we're looking for a little bit of uh, a little bit of a bright side today. Um, you know, a few good things to talk about coming out of last night's game. Rasmus Kupari continues to look great, and as you mentioned, Remo, he's actually skating up with Connor and Shifley right now. I'll be interested to see how that looks, but it's very clear that in you know the first three games, centering that fourth line. Kapari has been a difference maker right now. I think his confidence seems to grow each and every game. And maybe we're seeing a young man that was drafted in the first round finally coming into his own. And what an opportunity he'll get taking the place of his former Kings teammate, Gabriel Velarde, on that top line with Connor and Shifley. 
playing against Vegas tomorrow night in all likelihood. Yeah, that's what it looks like right now. And, you know, Kupari, I mean, he's a big he's a big guy. Might not be a finisher. He had that nice assist on Barron's goal in the, in the Florida game. Uh, he did have a breakaway uh, yesterday. So, uh, we'll you know, we'll see how it goes. I wonder if it's subject to change. But, um, you know, Rasmus Kupari, you talk about guys getting an opportunity. You know, wasn't much of a top-line guy in L.A. Here he is, you know, fourth line and uh, getting the opportunity with Gabe Velarde. Oh, and they're going to need him to contribute, and you're going to need him to score at Vegas. I mean, what they're they're man, they're a tough opponent. They're unbeaten to start the season, uh, beating what Dallas yesterday, defending Stanley Cup champions. You, I have to think they're among the favorites to repeat. So they're in a tough one on Thursday. Yeah, um, you know, as they say, let's um, let's quickly get to. Uh, just a little bit from last night, Reem. Uh, we've got the uh, let's just hear the bones, uh, bones, and then uh, there's a couple of uh, couple of prophetic clips that I think are, um, you know, we're, we're, we're very, very well spoken after a really tough night for him personally and the hockey club. But uh, let's just go quick to a seven um, bones, just in his thoughts on the game overall for his Winnipeg Jets. Yeah, we, we missed too many chances in the first one. We were, we played really well in the first. They played really well in the second. But we made it too easy for them in the second. Uh, the things that we were doing so well in the first in terms of um, competing in our zone and puck, managing the puck going through the, the neutral zone, which we knew we did such a good job in the first. In the second, we got stubborn and tried to make plays that weren't there and kept turning the puck over. And we just... So you take those two areas and uh, made it too easy for them to play. Yeah, there it was. And Bones, um, I mean, I think he nailed it. I mean, it was, it did seem sort of easy ream for the Kings, you know, especially in the third period. And, and listen, once they got that third goal, that was pretty much done. Um, you know, that one three one is a real bitch to get through, um, you know, when a team like the Kings are playing with the lead. And that goes back to what Bones said right off the hop. Um, you know, they had some glorious chances early on. I mean, the team really did have a lot of hop. I mean, they were out shooting them by a wide margin for a good portion of that first period. There was the near goal off the crossbar. There was a number of tough ones that just missed the net. Some nice saves by Talbot. Um, but that kept the LA Kings right in it, not having to play from behind. And uh, the minute that team got up, they... Uh, they played like a team that uh, knows exactly what to do when they have the lead on the road. Yeah, you look at their goals, you know, the Jets certainly got, you know, beat there in the corner. Um, with the first one, Dubois going hard to the net, you know, just after the power play expired. Uh, the second one, um, what well, is giveaway behind the net with, uh, you know, Schmidt and Dillon. Uh, not a great night for them in terms of goals against. And, uh, you thought, okay, you know, the Jets, they're only down two goals, but yeah, that, you know, three minutes into the third period, it's bouncing puck uh, through the neutral zone, you know, gets past Brendan Dillon, he's got to go in the corner, and Trevor Moore, you know, beats him out, and, you know, Perfetti goes behind to help, and it leaves uh, Kalia wide open in front, he just buries it past Hellebuck, and I don't know if there's any sign Hellebuck not at his top game that I know Trevor Moore, you know, picked the corner on that fourth goal, and Moore was the first star of the game, and his reaction after that was kind of like almost surprised uh, that it went in past Hellebuck. And then they scored the fifth one and it just seemed like, you know, they were kind of packing it in uh, yeah, at, the, I, at that I, point for the, like, I'm not, I can't really mm -hmm. read too much into the fifth, fifth one. I think they had kind of full. Shout out to Shifley intent. for scoring though. And we needed a, it. breaking the shutout and Bree not having PLD score the winning goal. Um, yes. PLD, who is not one of the three stars, by the way. Thank you to whoever picked that. That would have been even more salt in the wounds as the WST crew was leaving the section last night. Um, but let's hear from Perfetti, because obviously there was a lot of frustrated people about the hit that, that did not result in a penalty. Here's how Perfetti saw it after um, meeting, the gla meeting the boards head first after uh, being hit right in the numbers. thought I had... Uh... You know, established my numbers, but to him and you know, got it. I don't know. Felt like I got hit, but uh, it is what it is. Ref thought it was a clean play, so um, gonna take his word for it. And um, definitely didn't feel good, but uh, you know, one of those ones where you think about if you could put yourself in a better position. I thought, you know, I'd established uh, 
you know, my numbers to him and had my back to him. And, you know, he finishes through and a couple feet away from the boards and, you know, ha whatever happens, happens. And um, fast game and, um, yeah, it sucks. Yeah, a, a very clearly Cole, uh, frustrated Cole Perfetti after uh, after that play. Here's a, a little bit more from Perfetti. He expanded on it. Uh, still, frankly, incredulous, although not making too much of a stink about it afterwards, but it was clear that he, everyone in that room, was um, sort of shocked that there wasn't a penalty on it, especially the way it turned out with the Jets actually being on the PK with the instigator given out to Dylan Sandberg. I don't know if you see the replay. Uh my face is smeared against the, the boards and um, I mean I feel like I'm pretty defenseless and uh, I don't know just trying to get the puck in deep it's not much of a um, you know I'm not much of a threat there I'm just trying to get it in deep and you know just feel you know get hit from behind and your whole upper body kind of just go like that and face smear into the into the boards and um, didn't feel good that's for sure yeah it was a scary play um, I mean, that's exactly what happened. Face first into the boards. And I mean, more often than not, they'll err on the side of calling penalties in that case, especially early on when they seem to have called everything else. Very strange that that wasn't, uh, wasn't a call last night. Um, I want to just get one more clip. And this is about Dylan Sandberg, who stepped up and ate a couple hard, hard haymakers to the, uh, to the grill. Um, and, and and to be honest, they were hard enough that I was worried when I didn't see him on the bench in the third period, or sorry, in the penalty box in the third period while the 10-minute misconduct was going. I thought that maybe he had been injured too. Thankfully, that wasn't the case. He did return to the game. Uh, but Perfetti talked about his teammate Dylan Sandberg kind of stepping up for him after that controversial hit. It's kind of a thing, you know, we're, we're, we're family, stick together. Um, you know, Sammy there sticks up for me there and, and fights a guy and um you know you hate having to have a guy fight for you um but you know you appreciate it that goes a long way that you know your teammates your brothers are going to stick up for you and, and make sure that you know no one takes a cheap shot or run without having to you know have a couple of repercussions so you know i think that's great from our team um that's there's a lot of guys in here that are willing to step up for one another and um it just shows how tight we are and, and you know just really appreciate when guys do that. All right, so there's Cole Perfetti talking about Dylan Sandberg stepping up for him uh, last night. Listen, we're going to have Marat come on in a minute. Uh, again, I know we're a lot of talk about the crowd right off the bat. Uh, pretty good one tomorrow night, folks. The uh, Stanley Cup champs are in town to take on the Vegas Golden Knights. Obviously, tickets available for that one. The team's going to be on the road um, uh, coming up on uh, Saturday in Edmonton. I'll actually be at that game and then back in Winnipeg for that 745 start on Tuesday. Um, obviously, would love to see you at the rink. Um, and you know what? If maybe yesterday was a, um, you weren't at the game and you saw it, we're sort of thinking, geez, I'm planning on going to the games. I mean, get to winnipegjets.com. Uh, I'm sure there's plenty of information there on individual tickets, on ticket packages. And heck, if you were maybe thinking about getting seasons with a few friends, I can tell you there's some good seats available. Uh, and you can get into some good seats. So we'll do that, right? We'll uh, do that. And as I say, we're, we'll have someone on, I believe, from True North on Friday, sort of talk a little bit more frankly about the situation and uh, hopefully get this thing going in the right direction. Marat's joining us in just a sec. Hey, if you're looking for great prices on natural and organic supplements, beauty products, groceries, get on down to one of six Vita Health Fresh Market stores or online at myvita.ca where you can order online and get same-day delivery if your order's in by 11 a.m. And you'll also get a free gift when you place an order of $100 or more right now at myvita.ca. And uh, hey, if the stress of back to school or the upcoming holidays are getting to you, try Health First Ashwagandha Supreme, known, known for its stress-lowering effects and reducing mental stress, anxiety, cortisol levels, and even stress-related food cravings. It's on sale all month at Vita Health, empowering pe people to lead healthy lives, six Winnipeg locations, and online at myvita.ca. Um, you know Wallace and Wallace has been the fencing experts in Winnipeg since 1946. What you might not know 
is that they're also the overhead garage door leaders is the exclusive clope dealer in manitoba that overhead garage door had lots of ups and downs this summer and it's about to work a whole lot harder because winter puts much more stress on a garage door the right time to prevent downtime is now call wallace and wallace to book your inspection and maintenance service call today for residential and commercial overhead door sales and service there's only one name or two you need to know and that is Wallace and Wallace. And just before we bring in Murata, big shout out to the gang down at F Apparel. Guys, if you need to up your menswear game heading into the holiday season in the oncoming winter, get on down to F today. Uh, custom suits beginning at 400 bucks, along with chinos, golf pants, custom shirts, both tucked and untucked styles, and an incredible selection of menswear accessories. And don't forget, if you're getting married or in a wedding party, Talk to the guys at F about a 15% discount for the entire wedding party when you get your suits at F Apparel. They're at 190 Smith Street. You can make an appointment and find out more online at F. That's EPHapparel.com. All right. Fresh out of the rink after the morning practice after last night's game is Murata Tesh. Murat, great to have you back on the program. How are you? Great to be back, and uh, apologies for the technological headaches. Uh, you got a smooth ship to run. I caused a couple wrinkles, but I'm here, and I'm happy to be talking to you. Well, it is great, and uh, great to have you back. And uh, obviously, vibes a little different today than they were heading into that game. Um, you know, <laughs> listen, I spent about a half hour talking about it right off the bat. I mean, the game was almost secondary last night to the the crowd last night. I mean, I'm sure that was a lot of talk in the uh, um, in the press box last night, Marat. Um, just before we kind of exclusively focus on that, I mean, uh, what, what was your reaction when you saw just how empty a good portions of that rink was last night for game two of the season in a game that was highly anticipated with the return of PLD? Yeah, I think it's disappointing. Really, it is um, to, to look and to see that many empty seats um, in a game that you think that the Winnipeg Jets should be able to sell. You got Pierre Luc Dubois back in town uh, for the first time since the blockbuster trade. So you've got a little bit of an appeal. LA, I don't know how they draw compared to, say, if it were Toronto or Montreal or what have you. But I think that that's a pretty sellable game. And then when you have it early in a season where at least, you know, for guys like us that are day in, day out watching and, and writing about the team, there's there's kind of a fun style of play to them most nights. Now, there wasn't a whole lot of fun in their style of play last night, to be clear, but it's been a more entertaining, more dynamic team, I think, so far. I think there's some positive stories. You have the Hellebuck and Shifley signings. You have, you know, until Velarde's injury, you have a trade that looks like it's going really, really well. And so to look out and, you know, a lot of the unsold seats are, you know, in the upper decks and, and in sections that are pretty close to our eye line from press level too. So it's, it's stunning. I, I guess I would say, you know, I, it would be disappointing from the Jets perspective for sure. And just, just a bit of a shock to see. And at the same time, Huss, even as I say that, even as I say it's shocking, I think there have been signs. I think that you look back to say the season ticket drive video announced last uh, spring uh, if you look to presentations given to the business community where I can't remember which outlet wrote, uh, it, it was a great story talking about how a lot of other cities get more corporate money in terms of their season seats and, and boxes and that than Winnipeg does. You know, I think the fact that this has been a quiet background conversation for a little while makes me think that it is part of a, a, a trend. It's just... To, to go back to an earlier word, stunning to see when you see it viscerally in front of you for the first time, quite is such low numbers. Yeah, no, exactly. And listen, I know that that, you know, the, the messaging as subtle or not so subtle as it was, but it was somewhat subtle that, you know, this organization needs to, you know, to fill this building to be, you know, healthy and competitive long term. Uh, it, it probably resonates a little bit differently with fans today than maybe when they heard it in the summer, not really thinking very much about it. Um, anyways, as I say, we've talked about this you quite a bit, and I know there's a lot of talk in the chat about it. Let's get to the game last night. And, you know, I mean, I love the first period. It was a period where the Winnipeg Jets looked very similar to they had in the first six periods of the season. Um, skating really well, generating a ton of chances, 
having a number of you know opportunities that could have ended in the net. One that I think most of us thought was in the net that ended up not being in it. Um, but in a lot of ways, Murat, I felt that in some ways the game really kind of took a turn on the very unfortunate injury to Gabriel Velarde in that at that point, all of a sudden, everything got shaken up within the top lines. You didn't have a second line that was going very well to begin with. You're then moving up two guys that had played very well and continue to do so in Rasmus Kapari and Vlad Nemetsnikov. Um, But that was, you know, already there was a bit of a eerie feeling when he came to the crowd. And then the injury to Gabriel Velarde was... Um, uh, was a big, big moment and a, and a really tough one for the Winnipeg Jets as now they know, although it could have been worse, I think, based on what we saw, Gabe being out for um, well, four to six weeks, basically more than a month in all likelihood. Um, you know, a, a big, big hit to the club on the ice. Yeah, I mean, to have that injury and four to six weeks, yeah, it does seem like good news given just how unable Velarde was to put weight on his leg. You watch the clips and just the, the degree to which his leg twists uh, with Blake Lazat falling on him and taking him down there. It looked bad. And, you know, to his credit, he was able to get up and uh, and get himself down to get looked at. But it was also coming on the eve of, of news where in Montreal, Kirby Dak was out for the season, I believe, with just a, you know, a horrendous knee injury. And so that's kind of in the back of everybody's mind, or at least my mind as I'm watching him go off the ice, thinking like, could this be a really severe long-term situation? And thankfully for Velarde's sake, it, it it's, you know, four to six weeks as we know it today from Rick Botis. Um, I do... I do think that it affected the Jets in terms of how they played. I thought Nikolai Ehlers' answer to that question last night was pretty telling. He said, I want to say that it didn't affect us because, the, you know, there are standards that we should keep, but probably it did. I, I can't know. That's not an exact quote, but that was my takeaway from that moment. I got to say, too, the second period was a was a real disaster in a lot of ways where sort of that sadness that would accompany the Gabriel Velarde injury would turn to anger, I think, if you were a Jets fan. Because you saw, first of all, first few minutes of the period, LA's taking it to Winnipeg, taking it to Winnipeg. Morgan Barron gets a penalty that I'm not sure is a penalty. And the Kings score right at the tail end as you know the power play has just ended. Pierre-Luc Dubois, of all people, is the one who scores the game-opening goal. Then you watch Cole Perfetti get boarded from behind and goes face first into into the boards, and you know he's got a fresh scar from that today. I'm sure. Uh, I think that not only did the life come out of Winnipeg a little bit after that Villardi injury, but everything that could go wrong for them in the second period went wrong too. And refereeing wasn't to help. Um, Winnipeg just never got momentum back in a game where they had started to play poorly in the second period. And then I think the refs, refs let total control of it go. Yeah. The, uh, I mean, the, 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 the play on Perfetti was, it, it was so weird too, Marat, because I think the tendency early on in the season, certainly from what we've seen in Jets games has to been to call pretty much everything. And then, you know, a guy gets trucked right between the numbers, headfirst into the boards. I understood why Dylan Sandberg stepped up, and it didn't go well for him. But shout out to him for, you know, stepping up for his teammate. But to come out of that down a man, I think, was just another blow to a hockey club that had taken a few big hits so far, The you know, in the game. And you're right. I mean, the lull in the second period was, I mean, maybe it's somewhat explainable, but... At that point, the LA Kings took over, and we talked a lot about the one-three-one and how difficult it is at times to get through. That's a team that knows how to play with the lead, and um, from that point on, they basically just squeeze the Jets like a boa constrictor. Yeah, I mean, once you get into the third, and I think LA scores two goals off the counter attack, and one of them is a giveaway from that same Perfetti, I think that starts the play. Although, I think what happened in the middle of the ice with the puck bouncing through Brandon Dillon and, and battles behind the net, I think that had more to do with the goal. I just, you know, about that penalty situation again, like I go to, the, I go to that boarding, and it's a play that so often does get called. So you're thinking, okay, maybe they're letting stuff go. Sandberg fights uh, England, and you're thinking, okay, well, that's a fight, and, you know, good for him for trying. The fight clearly didn't go his way. 
and they call an instigator, which is a penalty that you so rarely see get called, even when it could completely legitimately be called. So there's a situation where, okay, for a second, you're thinking they're letting everything go, but then they call that. And Winnipeg ends up shorthanded from the situation. It just, uh, it, it was a difficult situation. I think that you know, it's on them to rise above and find other ways or what have you. But it was just a stunning turn in a, in a short period of time um, to to give up the first goal to Dubois, to give up another goal in that period. You need a really concerted comeback energy and attempt. It looked like that for maybe moments. But uh, but you're right that one three one like one of the they can change its shape. They can change its pressure, uh, its pressure points and things like that. They can really, though, when they're up, clog that neutral zone with it and force dump-ins. And Winnipeg recovered a couple, got zone time for a little bit, but it wasn't a situation where they were frequently winning the puck back and leading to dangerous chances inside the King's zone because everybody is in position. And that's a shame, I think, for Winnipeg because the Kings hadn't found their game in their first couple games of the season, right? Like, they went to Australia during preseason. They came back. They hadn't been firing on all cylinders. Todd McClellan basically said as much uh, in, in different words in the morning. And so for Winnipeg not to be able to get a lead early, and now they're playing that catch-up game, well, that's the one part of LA's game that I think you know is on lockdown. It's that 1-3-1 one, one and playing and protecting a lead is something they've done so long and for, for so many years that you know just because they're rusty to start the season, it was still pretty good for them last night. Um, Marat, what have you made? I mean, we know how important Nikolai Ehlers is to this club, especially playing on that second line with a young player playing center for the first time. What have you made of Nikolai Ehlers through three games? Yeah, he looks like a player that's missed camp. Yeah, I, I really think so because the speed is there uh, from time to time. Really nice passes, really nice plays are there. But I see him as a guy right now whose timing is off. I see him as a guy. There's this one play, I think it was the first period, where he got a chance in the low slot and skied it so high it went over the crossbar, over the glass, and you know into the netting. And he just looked skyward and just didn't have it in that moment. It was That's kind of how I've associated his, his start to the season. You know I believe in his ability to score and to produce, and you know... Um, what the numbers say and just how elite of a scorer at five on five he's been for the for the last several years. But this Ehlers for the first little while has not been it. I think part of it is rhythm and timing coming out of camp uh, where he wasn't able to get into exhibition games. Uh, I also think part of it is chemistry with new line mates uh, a little bit with Perfetti and Niederreiter as, as it's been so far. But uh, but one thing you cannot say is that he's been his best self and Without Villardi, you absolutely need a guy like Ehlers to step up and 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 be not only his best self, but uh, but if he is if he is that good, then it, a lot of the other lines can snap into place, and he has not been that good yet. Now you were down at the practice today. Maybe tell us a little bit about how things looked, what they were working on, but also how things looked up front. I mean, Remus was just kind of going over the lines. I got to tell you, I mean, one of the most pleasant surprises of this entire season has been what Rasmus Kapari's looked like in a Winnipeg Jet uniform. Great wheels. I, I don't know if he's much of a finisher, but things have been happening when he's on the ice, and looks like he's going to be uh, riding with Shifley and Connor. A very interesting move, but one that I would say probably has been earned. So it's interesting. I... I spoke to a player so long in the dressing room, and that's part of my delay here, um, for a story that I'm working on that I missed a good chunk of what Rick Bonus has said, and I'm a little bit behind on it right now. But I was talking to somebody who suggested that maybe Mason Appleton gets the bump to the first line, despite what we saw in practice. And so that's worth checking um, to follow up on what Bonus's comments were. Uh, it may be that there are some placeholder stuff going on. It also may be somebody was saying, I think this was Mike McIntyre I was talking to in the hallway on my way to rush here, was uh, Vlad Nemesnikov might move to center to to help facilitate some of these changes as well. And not all of these things were things that, uh, that we got long looks at uh, on the ice in practice. So I'm a little bit behind on the, on the line situation. What I will say... Um, is that players like Kupari, Nemestikov to a degree too, but he's uh, more of a veteran. 
it's such a refreshing thing for Winnipeg to be able to go four lines deep with players who can make things happen, who can make plays that lead to goals. You're not hoping to to tie the game 0-0 when they're on the ice. And if they're able to maintain some sort of balance going forward with Velarde's injury, I mean, it it absolutely bodes well for their ability to weather it. At the same time, as much of a luxury as that is, I'm not personally, I'm not... I'm afraid to, to, to say Rasmus Kupari has arrived. And if you give him top six minutes right now, he's going to produce with that too. Like I, I, I am leery of just how much offense to expect for some of these guys that have impressed lower down the lineup so far. Well, well, you know what? I mean, let's talk big picture because I think part of what seemed to be working so well with Velarde, and again, Velarde is certainly a more, uh, a player that has proven he can score at a much higher rate than Rasmus Kupari although probably in very much different roles. But it wasn't necessarily that, you know, Velarde was the one setting up Kyle Connor and Mark Shifley. It was what he was doing, winning puck battles on the boards, I mean, with the speed, making the right passes. And those are some of the things that I think Kapari's been doing so well when he's been out on the ice that maybe makes him an option. Now, this is just from Ken, um, just to, to a little bit of an update. Bonus confirmed that Nemestikov is going to move to center and Perfetti's going to slide over to the wing with Nikolai Ehlers for the game against Vegas. Mason Appleton is an option to slide up to the Jets' top line with Kyle, with Shifley and Connor. Kapari is an option as well. We'll see, said Bonus. So not really committing to either of those players. I mean, I guess, I guess what they're thinking about with new Mason Appleton is that he can be a guy that does some of those things, can win some puck battles, can get the puck and get it to those guys that are really going to make things happen offensively. I'm not sure that it's a great fit, to be perfectly honest with you. And I'm looking at some of the uh, the chatters that say that, you know, if anything, Appleton's had some glorious opportunities right now in the role that he has and you know hasn't made a lot of them, although he did score on that uh, very memorable goal on Saturday, courtesy of Josh Morrissey's stick and Adam Lowry. Um but, I mean, if you were making that line right now, do you like Nemetsnikov being in the middle of Perfetti and Ehlers? Um, and based on what else is there, who makes the most sense to be playing with Shifley and Connor in your mind? Well, yeah, you know, as a, as a general rule, I like Nemetsnikov and Ehlers playing together. It's a small sample from the end of last season. And I just felt like, like Ehlers is a guy who plays with a tremendous amount of chaos in his game. And I think that that fits with some people and it doesn't fit with others. And I really got the impression that Nemesnikov sort of was picking up what Ehlers was, was doing maybe even better than a lot of other Jets teammates have over the years. And I, it just, that's my memory of that time. So I'm very curious to see it now. Uh, Cole Perfetti being moved to wing keeps him in the top six. I suppose another option would have been to put Perfetti up uh, on that top line. Um, you know, Niederreiter would be an option to go on that top line as well in terms of being able to win battles and keep the puck going in, in good directions. And if I had to say, if you're going to go with that perfetti nemesnikov Ehlers line, probably Nino Niederreiter would be my choice for uh, for that first line right wing. And it's because I believe in him to win those battles even more than Appleton, more than Kupari. And I believe in him to get to the net and get to that uh, that those dangerous areas of the ice. Different style of play from from Connor and Shifley. And I got to say, like, Velarde has impressed me so much, not just winning those battles, but his vision when he's got, when he's, when he's going into corners, has the puck, is has been protecting it from other players. His head has been up, and I think he's really read where Shifley and Connor are going in ways that few line mates have. I, don't, I just don't think you can replace that. So for me, it's about, you know, it's, it's about somebody who's going to advance the puck up the ice and, and just you know, get into the boards, go to the dirty areas and put pucks in situations where Connor and Shifley can maybe handle more of the offensive load themselves. For me, Niederreiter's got that, uh, got that. I rate him higher than I would rate Mason Appleton at that role. Kupari, very curious. I mean, I, I might want to have a look at it just because he's new and just to see. But again, I, uh, I, I'm i slow on on believing that he's got it. So if you're asking me for my vote, it's Niederreiter. And I realize that's not one of the options. So, uh, so what do I know? Well, I mean, it certainly is an option for Rick Bonus, But one of the, 
part of the reason why I'd love to see them give a crack to those players, as we mentioned, is because the third line right now looks like it's going to be Aya Fallo, Lowry, and Niederreiter. And to me, those players playing with Adam Lowry sets up the best third line we've seen here in a long, long time. I mean, ideally, you know, and listen, the team's not going to be fully healthy maybe at any point this season now that Velarde's out long-term. We'll see what happens over the next four to six weeks while he is out. But... I've already been impressed with what I have fellows brought to that line. And, you know, to be honest, I think Niederreiter is a big upgrade on Mason Appleton. And if that line was able to play consistently for a long time, I think you're, I think the potential of not only keeping the puck out of your own end and doing a good job defensively against top lines, but making things happen offensively gets cranked up a few notches. If you've got I have and Niederreiter on the same line with Adam Lowry. And I'm sure that's what bonus is thinking. Yeah, it's been interesting over the years to watch the difference between Adam Lowry when he's had, say, Andrew Kopp and Brandon Tanev on his wings and how effective that was. And then you sort of, you watched him go through a, a rotating cast and crew of players without a lot of NHL experience. Uh, Christian Veselainen is the one I always go to as an example, but the idea that he was going to be the ideal fit on that line, I just, I, you know, I, I just can't see it. And I just, it, it confuses me even looking back on it. But it seems to me that when you give Lowry quality line mates, he can he can cook. He can be a top nine forward who is more than just shut down and who can create as well. And you're seeing that a little bit. You saw it in the playoffs. You saw it down the stretch last year too. And I guess the 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 question or the mystery in my mind is: Does he need both guys to be that good? A la the example you've given of I follow and Niederreiter both on his wing, or can he get away with it just being one? Because Niederreiter, Lowry, and Appleton, I think, was the, the the group down the stretch last year. And they trucked their opponents, you know, by puck possession numbers, in terms of where the puck was on the ice, in terms of the real goals they scored, too. So I guess I'm optimistic that if you gave one of those players, I follow or Niederreiter to Lowry, you'd be able to free one of them to push higher up the lineup uh, and, and to win those battles for, say, Shifley and Connor even more so than Appleton or Kupari or whomever else. That's kind of where my thought is at. Well, Murat Atesh of The Athletic. Of course, Monday, Murat, you uh, had the uh, long piece on Pierre-Luc Dubois. And I guess, you know, last night, a disappointing way to sort of put a bow on the Dubois experience here in Winnipeg. He, in a lot of ways, got the last laugh with the goal and the win last night. Um But I just wanted to ask you about, uh, you know, conversations with him and putting that together. And um, a guy that seems to have had a plan for a long time, has executed it, got what he wanted, and um, well, got his first win and his first goal with his new team, ironically, here in Winnipeg, where he was a member of the club for the last three seasons. Yeah, that's, that's the part of the story that I sort of feel bad for Jets fans about. You know, the, the trade, great. You know, I think that you've got some good players that came back for him. Um, the quality of play that he played in Winnipeg, usually good, and obviously he had some real slumps as well. And Okay, great, but to have to watch him score his first goal for the Kings, to have to watch him get his first win for the Kings, and the only thing that stopped Dubois' goal for being the, from being the, the game winner was Mark Shifley's goal just at the tail end of the game. And maybe fans don't care about that, but, you know, in the chat, let I mean, speak up and let me know I'm wrong. Like... I, I think that that's got to suck a little bit to, to watch him have that night, especially on a night that Gabriel Velarde was hurt and you're concerned about that. Um, so that's kind of, that was what I was thinking last night. You know, he, he puts his arms up to the fans in the corner and I think there were some people with Kings jerseys there, so it made sense. But also I wondered for a second, was it a taunt? And no, I don't think it was. Um, so... So yeah, then to then to speak to the story, and you know, I'm I'm really happy with that turned out. It was a it was a really good mix of people saying, "Hey, I understand more about why he did the things that he did after reading this story." It was a good mix of saying, "Wow, you really took a run at this guy," um, which a few people said, and I was surprised about that. And then some folks who are just so over Pierre Luc Dubois and so like done with this guy that did not choose their city. And that's Columbus fans and, and Winnipeg Jets fans are just like, why did you have to write a deep dive about Pierre-Luc Dubois life that humanizes him? That's a puff piece. And I think that when you get the balance of all of those things 
and you sort of peel back the onion just a little bit more and adding more to the discussion of why he did what he did, his actual relationship with Tortorella, his actual feelings about Winnipeg. I, I'm happy that it went that way. The conversation to make that story was something like 45 minutes long. And, um, you know, and I, I'm, I'm glad that I'm glad that it worked out that way. I, I also got to say, Hus, that probably the moment at which I first perceived that I had a shot at this story or something to that effect, that the relationship was good, was in Los Angeles last spring, one of the Jets' last road trips of the year, I think, um, where I had interviewed Dubois about Winnipeg struggling to get to the middle of the ice. And then afterwards, I'm like, hey, you know, uh, Haley and I, we went out to such and such a restaurant last night, and this guy from Game of Thrones was there. And Dubois lit up and it went from like hockey players speak about getting to the middle of the ice to like, okay, let's talk. What was that restaurant like? Who was there? What was the scene like? All that sort of stuff. Uh, Where did you eat? And now he gets excited about that too. And I just remember it being like, oh, this is a really big part of what drives him. And that type of lifestyle, I think, is a really big deal for him as a person. And so we talked to him more about it in the playoffs. I talked to his family about it. I talked, I I've talked to so many people who were not quoted in that piece to try to get an accurate three-dimensional look of what is important to this person and what went into his decisions. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to talk about it because I'm glad with how it turned out. Yeah. I mean, it was a really interesting piece. I mean, some people will take it as uh, this is just an entitled guy that was thinking about himself all the time and maybe at the expense of his team. Uh, others will say this is completely within his right, which is true. I mean, that is, I mean, that's, you can't really deny that. I mean, the CBA is set up where at a certain point you've got an idea about, you know, where you can go. And he was set on that for, uh, for a long time and uh, it ended the way that it did. If you haven't read it folks, and that you do want one more little piece of PLD content, go over to the athletic. I get why some people are certainly ready to move on. And uh, the Winnipeg Jets are going to have to move on from last night in a number of ways um, and especially get ready for a huge test with the unbeaten Stanley Cup champion Vegas Golden Knights here tomorrow. Murat, as always, great to have you on the program. Have a great day and thanks for doing this. Hey, thanks for having me. Look forward to being set up properly with uh, with all the good HD uh, quality next time. Thanks for having me, Huss. Good stuff. There's Murat Atesh of The Athletic uh, with us at WPG Murat. We're going to get a little bomber update from uh, Ted Wyman coming up in a sec. And, of course, all our bomber reports are brought to you by Princess Auto. Bombers, Elks, 6 p.m. on Saturday And the Princess Auto tailgate zone opens at 4 p.m. Get there early and get ready for the Bombers to hopefully book their ticket and officially confirm the West Final here in Winnipeg. Of course, Princess Auto is where you'll find the best deals on the most unique assortment of tools and equipment around. Everything you need to complete the projects on your list or start something new is at Princess Auto. Visit them online or in-store today. You can always shop online at 24-7, 365 at princessauto.com. More gorgeous weather a little extra time to uh, do some of that irrigation work, maybe artificial turf. You know, Consolidated Supply are the experts in all of that. The irrigation leaders, artificial turf, golf carts and vehicles as the club car dealer in Manitoba, many with some incredible industrial use. But they've also got other great options for your property, including hot tubs, which might be a great addition this winter coming up, and amazing outdoor kitchens. Consolidated Supply also 12 months a year, your leaders in small engine parts and repair. Pop by and see them at the showroom, open to the public, 1395 Niagara Road East, or find out more online at cte.ca. And uh, hey, a big shout out to the gang at Royal Sports. I know a lot of people be heading down, getting ready for playoff time for the Blue Bombers. If you need to up that Blue Bomber gear in the closet, Get on down to Royal Sports, a great Blue Bomber section with tons of exclusives, not to mention the biggest section in town of Winnipeg Jets merchandise with many things you won't find anywhere else, full selection of jerseys and more, NFL merch, and of course you know that Royal Sports for 40 years has been the hockey superstore in town for players of all ages and all skill levels. It's all waiting free at Royal Sports, 750 Pemina Highway. Give them a follow on Instagram as well for the latest merchandise drops and sale information at Royal Sports Pemina. All right, let's bring uh, Teddy Wyman in from the Winnipeg Sun. 
Ted Fresh back from Bomber Practice. Ted, what's going on? How are you? I'm doing well, sir. Uh, good to talk to you again. You're sure right about the weather. I mean, what a week to be able to be outside covering Bomber Practice. And I certainly heard from a few players that they were mighty happy to be practicing in the sun and warm temperatures as opposed to what it could be. They'll be getting playoff weather soon enough, I am afraid. Um, hey, listen, just before we get to the Bombers, um, and we won't get to the game last night, but you've been in this city for a long time. you covered sports here for a long time. I mean, as disappointing as the result was and the injury to Gabe Velarde, I mean, for most of us that were in the building last night, the story was so many empty seats. Um, Ted, what uh, just wanted to, before we get to the Bombers, just your take on uh, – where things are at right now with this hockey club, this community, and how uh, how concerning what we saw last night and may see again tomorrow night at Canada Life Centre. Yeah, I uh, spent a bit of the morning talking about this with Paul Friesen and Scott Billick, my colleagues on our show, Jet Setting on WinnipegSun.com, and we were, you know, we were talking about uh, this very thing, and it it, it was it, that's a shocking number. It absolutely is eleven thousand two hundred and change. That's, I mean, those are the doldrums of Winnipeg Jets 1.0 to me. Uh, there were a lot of seasons back then when, uh, you know, the, the building was not very full at all. They'd have pretty small crowds, especially before Christmas. Um, this has that kind of a feel to it. And, and it's really odd because it's coming off an end of season situation last year where the organization really started a marketing drive, really a push to try to get more people to buy season tickets, uh, came up with new ways to get people in the seats. And, you know, obviously at the very, you know, start of this season had a big splashy signing of Connor Hellebuck and Mark Shifley. There's a real push going on. And yet they, you know, this has not worked. It's not working. The, the, the fans are staying away and it's concerning. I mean, it. You have to say, it, like, it's it's concerning. This is the smallest market in the NHL. It's one of the smallest buildings. Uh, if it weren't for the, you know, sorry, the joke of a building in Arizona right now, which is only five thousand seats, this would be the the smallest, I believe. And they're not filling it. And this was such a different thing. This is where the optimism and excitement about the Jets returning. Uh, back in 2011 was that this would not happen again. You know, it's a passionate hockey market and people will pay to watch the games. And here we are um, 12 years later. And, and you know, this is sort of, uh, it's a declining attendance situation. So I guess that's a long answer for you, Hus, but honestly, I, I'm a little bit stumped by it. I, I didn't really see this kind of a decline coming. I was kind of anticipating a response when uh, when you know people talked at the end of last season where this could go if the attendance is uh, is poor uh, you know i think in a lot of ways that was somewhat foreshadowing and and I, I mean as they say we've talked a lot about this so far so we'll get to the bombers but um this is something that i think a lot of people feared and maybe it was clear this is what they were seeing behind the scenes and that was sort of why they went forward now i'm not sure it sort of felt like they pulled back that forever Winnipeg campaign, kind of tried to do some things, you know, when it came to the corporate community, which obviously hasn't been enough at this point. Um, but as they say, there's no easy answers right now, but I think that there is a bit, uh, if, if you didn't acknowledge it or it wasn't a big deal before, it was a very big deal last night. And, um, we can only all hope for everybody that's got a stake in this city, in this hockey club, whether you're a fan, an employee, in an ancillary business like ours that, you know, spend so much time talking about this, oh. that um, that better days uh, better days are ahead. Because uh, if they're not, you know, you, I mean, let's, let's be real here. You don't know how many days there will be because it is eerily like the trends of what we saw in 1.0, and uh, that is not something anybody wants to see happen again. Um, how are things down at the park today? Um, uh, bombers getting on. Any sign of Dalton shown? Uh, what uh, what things look like? Uh, let's maybe start off with him. They said anything about him. He left that BC game, didn't return. I saw him getting a haircut at Modern Man earlier this week. His hair always, always looks great, but not out on the field last. Uh, not on the field right now, preparing for Edmonton. No, he's not. Um, I, I went back and watched the game, uh, the, the, the incident where he was injured. It was on his last catch. 
of the game in the fourth quarter. And, and you know, they, they, it wasn't obvious uh, on TSN, but uh, if you looked at it closely, you could see him lifting up his leg as he was running uh, his next route on the, on the next play. It clearly was hobbled, wasn't able to run his route and ended up going off and he did not return to the game. Um, no sign of him at practice. Uh, absolutely nothing from Mike O'Shea. However, I talked to several of his teammates today and I got the impression he's not going to be back anytime soon. Um, uh, you know, Drew Wallatarski called it a big injury. So it doesn't look good to me. To, I, I don't think we'll see Dalton shown in the rest of the regular season. Um, there, I, no, I really don't think that's going to happen. But is there a chance he comes back for the playoffs? I just don't know. I, you know, all I have is these words, big injury. I don't know how long that means. I don't know what it means. They are listed him as an ankle injury on the uh, on the injury report, and he hasn't been able to practice. And they have, you know, they, they want to take care of business this weekend against Edmonton and have the opportunity to rest up their injured players before the West final. Um, that would give them a couple of weeks to do it. And is there a chance he could come back at that point? Well, that's certainly what they're hoping for, but who really knows at this point? Um, Ted, how are the Bombers approaching this game? Um, I mean, it's an interesting situation because they have not yet technically clinched the West final. Um, yeah, they yeah. do have one more game. So um, do we anticipate? I mean, listen, Sean's injured. Other than that, this is going to be all systems go. The ones are there. Get out there. Have a big, strong performance. Take care of the job yourself. And then give Mike O'Shea and management options when it comes to that final game against Calgary? Absolutely. I don't, there's no other way of looking at this. It's not like, like I have heard other people say, technically they haven't clinched first place yet. They haven't clinched first place yet. They did beat BC and get the upper hand, but they need to win one more game. And this is their best opportunity at home against an Edmonton team that is four and 13 and has lost their last three games. So, I think there's not much question in my mind that the Bombers are going to take this very seriously. Uh, they're going to go out there, try to take care of business, make sure that they have the home playoff game. Um, they, well, they already have a home playoff game in their in their back pockets, but they want it to be the West final and not the West semifinal. And, you know, they should be able to do it, Huss. There's no doubt about it. Edmonton has played better. Edmonton has given them some trouble. Those are two things that are true. But that, that's a team that's beatable. There's a lot of holes in it. Um, they've, they've made a lot of mistakes this year. The Bombers are a much, much more balanced team. They should be able to get it done. Uh, all I'm saying is they know this is an important game. This is by no means a gimme, and it's by no means a foregone conclusion at this point that they have clinched first place because all BC needs to do is win their last game and have Winnipeg, if Winnipeg didn't win their last two, BC would get first place still. So, it, you know, it, it, it's it's one of those ones where you can say that it's pretty much locked up, but you still got to play those games and you got to win them. Any idea? I mean, listen, the Edmonton is into next year territory right now. We know what Chris Jones, you know, in normal times does with his roster as far as bringing new players in and changing things over. Any idea how the Elks are sort of going into this game? Uh, all systems go for them. They're just trying to win or... We're going to see a whole bunch of new players in for uh, Chris Jones, just giving people some game action because the game really doesn't matter one way or the other to the visitors. I don't have enough information about that on hand right now, Has to be honest. I've been focused on what the Blue Bombers are doing. Um, but I don't think it matters. I really don't think it matters. I think no matter who Edmonton brings to town, they're here, work, um, many, many of them are playing for jobs next year. They're playing to get something on tape to show that coaching staff that they have uh, an ability to be a, a good contributor in the CFL and for the Edmonton Elks. So um, this is going to be no different, I think, than any other game. This team was 0-9. And yeah, they won, They ended up winning four games and had a chance, really, to start getting towards the playoffs. Uh, but they did not um, succeed at the most important time of the season. So now they're back in that mode where they've been most of the season, which is just let's try and put something together and try to uh, get some wins, see what Trey Ford can do at quarterback. And we know that he is the kind of quarterback that gives the Bombers some problems because he primarily is a runner. Uh, he's not necessarily thinking pass first. 
I just think whoever they bring, if they bring their most talented roster, that's a, it's a talented group. They have not played well, but they've got a lot of good players. And if they bring a lot more guys that are here to just try and make their name, well, those guys are going to be playing for a lot as well. So I, I just don't think the Bombers can take this even the tiniest bit lightly. They need to get out there and absolutely play their best game and make sure that it's not even close. They need to win this game and and just make sure they take care of business because having that home game in the West Final would be massive. The BC Lions are a dome team. Uh, they're not going to like playing in Winnipeg in November, and it's going to be the Blue Bombers' advantage if that game is in Winnipeg. Speaking of playing in November, um, I can't believe it, but the Calgary Stampeders <laughs> have their destiny in their own hands right now. Yeah. The Riders are nine-point home underdogs to the Argos in their final game. And if they were to lose, Calgary would only need to win one game. And even if they lose to BC, if Saskatchewan loses and Winnipeg wins this weekend, which both you know Toronto and Winnipeg are big, big favorites, the Bombers may be playing Calgary in that final game of the regular season with nothing to play for and Calgary can win and get in. What a disaster for the Riders. When you think they beat BC and the Bombers back-to-back weeks through the Labor Day Classic, and now for the second year in a row, they have not won a game after Labor Day. You know what? I I hate to say I told you so, but I <laughs> never understood why they kept Craig Dickinson and his staff on for another year. I think they made a big mistake. I, I don't think he had the room last year. I don't think he has the room now. Um, I think the the inmates have been running the asylum there for far too long. And his most telling statement this week was that it was going to be a challenge to get his players motivated to play this game against Toronto. Well, do you have a chance to clinch a playoff spot? And it's a challenge to get motivated? This shocks me. That kind of use of words really surprises me and i i just i don't understand how they've let this happen with the organization in saskatchewan i think they need to clean house and really uh you know bring in some other people and really turn things around there it, it, the, the fan base there is disillusioned by what they've seen the last couple of seasons and you're talking about barely being able to hold off a calgary team that's just been terrible this season you know they they've Falling on hard times themselves, without question. And here they are. They've only got five wins. They got two games left in the season, and they might have a chance to get into the playoffs in an absolute turtle race. It's really kind of amazing that that's how it's gone. The most telling thing about it all is that you can argue that the East Division is actually better than the West this season because Saskatchewan, Calgary, and Edmonton have all been so bad in the West. So um, I, I really am. Uh, I, I'm pretty stunned by how that's gone. I do expect there to be big changes in Saskatchewan. And I don't think whichever team wins between those two is going to be a challenge, probably for the BC Lions in the semifinal. And, uh, you know, Bill could conceivably be the Bombers. I don't think it would be much of a challenge. Yeah, no, I'm uh, I, I'm with you on that one. And, uh, you know, listen, a lot of talk about, you know, what our uh, local NHL team has to do work-wise to uh, get some butt back, butts back in seats and get people on board. That is a very similar situation with the erosion of that fan base and certainly the belief in everything that's going on in Saskatchewan right now. It has been a uh, two very, very dark years, and this seems like it's going to be the exclamation point because Saskatchewan, with how bad Calgary and Edmonton were a month ago, it seemed like it was done, that they weren't very good, but they were going to be a playoff team, and to miss the playoffs would be a massive, massive failure for that club where uh, as opposed to where they've been. Ted, fill us in on uh, what you and the uh, Sun team have coming up over the next few days heading into this game on the weekend. And, uh, of course, lots of great Jets coverage with the other fellas. Oh, yeah, man. It's uh, all over the all over the map with uh, Jets and Bombers coverage, of course. Uh, you know, today I'm doing the story basically on how they fill the void of Dalton Schoen. And I do think it's kind of funny because he's such an important player. He's such a big part of this offense, such a main target for 
uh, Zach Caleros. But the fact is they have Kenny Lawler and they have Nick Dembski and they have Drew Olatarski and Rashid Bailey who have all been very good receivers in this league. And they're going to get in Brendan O'Leary Orange and Greg McRae as well. And uh, and and Brady Oliveira, they they Zach Caleros threw to nine different receivers in the last game. They really do know how to spread it around, so it shouldn't be a huge problem. But it's big shoes to fill without uh, without Dalton shown in there, and lots of other cool things to watch for with the Bombers. Um, this game, as I said, is important for them. And as for the Jets, Paul Friesen's got a really good piece. I'm sure I haven't read it yet, but he's uh, he's working on a piece about the attendance, which really is the talking point in Winnipeg today, uh, without question. And and then, uh, of course, Scott Billick has got lots of stuff on the Jets, who are taking on oh, only the Stanley Cup champs tomorrow night. It's obviously going to get better than it was. <laughs> they did not play well against the LA Kings. I don't think it could go too much worse than that, but uh, they're going to have their hand full against Vegas, of course. Ted, always great having you on the program, my man. Uh, keep it up, and uh, we'll talk to you soon. Appreciate it. Great to see you, man. Have a good one. You too. There's Ted Wyman, uh, sports editor of the Winnipeg Sun. You can check out Ted's work, and I'll be in, very interested to read Freezer's column tomorrow in the uh, in the newspaper as well. All right. Um, we are going to check in with uh, our pal Bernie Reichardt from Hockey Manitoba in just a minute. Uh, before we do that, hey, a big shout-out to our friends at Boston Pizza. Uh, I know we had some good laughs yesterday with the piece that uh, our buddy Carter Chen did. He met me for Monday Night Football at BP earlier this week you can check that on the social channels but uh, it certainly was i mean there is no better place to get together with the gang for the game than your local boston pizza and now uh as we've been talking about hopefully there'll be more people at the game and hitting bp afterwards for home games um, but for instance saturday night after the bomber game where else are you going to go than your local bp to check out the jets and oilers after the bombers hopefully finish the job and officially clinch the west Check out the new Appy menu. Carter and I tried most of it yesterday. Oh, there's those Cajun shrimp. They were amazing. Um, and, of course, ice-cold schooners, world-famous BP wings, gourmet pizzas, and more. And, hey, if you are staying at home, you can always order online at bostonpizza.com. Um, and, hey, it was nice to see those generics in the house last night. Um, of course, Craft Beer Corner at Jet Games now includes... Winnipeg's favorite local beer, Little Brown Jug. Uh, get it when you're at the game in the north end, south end of the main concourse and Craft Beer Corner in Section 310. In the meantime, you can find all the great Little Brown Jug beers around the city wherever they sell great beer, but the best place to get it is at the brewery and tap room on William Avenue. And well, we might be able to squeeze a few more days on the LBJ patio if Mother Nature keeps smiling at us uh, the way she is right now. Um, hit up them up online, littlebrownjug.com for uh, more information. And of course, you can also order with citywide delivery. And hey, a big shout out to Nick and Nikki and the Nick and Nikki DQ group. Four locations, including DQ Northgate, DQ Polo Park, DQ St. Anne's, and DQ Niverville. They've also got the new Pita Pit out in Niverville. Healthy, fresh fast and delicious pita pit so good great catering as well hit them up on x at pita pit niverville if you do want to inquire about pita pit catering from nick and nicky out in niverville all right lots going on at hockey manitoba right now it's been a minute since we've had our pal bernie reichardt on the program but bernie joins us now just before heading off to uh the whl cup bernie what's going on welcome back to wst Oh, hold on a second. I think you're muted. Either that or I can't hear you. Oh, there you I'm go. Good. There you're good. What's well, going on, Bernie? Good. Yeah. Sorry about that. I don't know if that was my problem on my end or. That was me. Sorry. Nope. Oh. Hey, I'm, uh, we're excited today. We're uh, a couple hours away from taking on Team Alberta. So our, our players are ready. And uh, yeah, it's been a minute since I've been on here, Huss. It's. Uh, Excited to see you. Well, it's good to have you back. Tell us about this WHL Cup um, uh, and obviously Hockey Manitoba's role in it. Bet. Well, we're one of four branches here. Um, the four Western branches, Manitoba, Saskatchewan, Alberta, BC. Uh, the WHL sponsors this this uh, event. It's our top uh, 2008 born players. So players under 16. So our, our top 15 year olds. And, uh, you know, this is this, uh, the ninth or 10th year for this, this particular event. Uh, and uh, you know, obviously, we're one of the four participants, and again, we're excited to, uh, excited to get going. It's a it's a it's a long bus ride, fourteen hours, but we 
we split it in half and had some practices in the way and uh you know we've got a pretty good group of kids here so uh and they're 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 excited to get on the ice um the, the whl cup i'd imagine for kids that are under 16 i mean these are your top under 16s great opportunity for them to play against their peers and the best in the other province um these young players many of them have been through many hockey manitoba programs before but considering how close many of these young uh, kids are to playing in the WHL, uh, in a lot of ways, um, a stepping stone, if you will, to the next stage of their junior hockey careers, which, um, you know, for probably a bunch of kids in this tournament, will end up going all the way. Yeah, they this tournament's had some some pretty, pretty good hockey players. Uh, you know, I can read you a list of a bunch, but uh, obviously the top players in the west uh, part of the country are. You know, participating, you know, a lot of real good players from our province, which uh, we're proud of as, as an organization. But, you know, it's our it's our, our responsibility to give these kids a chance and our program runs so we can, you know, have kids evaluated and, and watched. And, and our, our program starts in the spring where there's there's 100 and, you know, 120 players and that gives a lot of them an opportunity to be seen by the, you know, the Western League scouts and our Manitoba Junior Scouts. And, you know, it's, it's about those opportunities. So these kids are excited, these 20 we have here. Know, but we, you know, we're proud of what we do for all of our players leading up to and giving those those players an opportunity. But a great, op, you know, a great chance for these these kids head to uh, the Centrum where the Red the Rebels play. It's a it's a pretty neat experience to practice there this morning for some of these kids. And and yeah, I, again, we you know, we're going to give her everything we have as a province. We're we're a pretty small province compared to the other what, three branches, but you know, we're always uh, we're always ready when the puck drops. Well, and I mean, a, a big province area-wise, and I'm sure that's one of the more unique challenges is, um, you know, scouting and getting players from all around it. I mean, obviously, Winnipeg is going to probably have the majority just based on population, but fill us in on the mix and uh, how many kids there are from other communities around our province that'll be uh, wearing the brown and gold. Sure. Uh, you know, I, I've been involved in the program for a number of years, and it, it's always, you know, we have about 50% of the hockey playing population in Winnipeg. 50% rurally, and it's funny how it works. We don't, you know, there's no quotas or anything. We just, you know, we're taking the players that that are, you know, have the ability to play, and our coaches pick the, you know, the players that they think are, you know, the best players for the team, you know, in a team concept. So it's funny how it works. So there's always around, you know, 50% of the players. You know, it's 12 and eight. Sometimes it's 10 and 10 and 10. Sometimes it's 11 and nine. It's funny how it works. But yeah, we have, you know, we have kids from from out west. We have. Uh, you know, we have some kids from the east. We have a couple kids from, uh, you know, just outside the city, and then you know, obviously some kids from the city. So, yeah, I mean, our our camp in 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 the springtime, we have kids from all over, and it's uh, we have, you know, there's scouts watching all the time. I try to explain that to the players and and parents. There's there's people watching all the time, and you know, if your if your son you know has the ability, he'll be invited to our camps, and and you know, there's it's a good mix of kids. I I I, I can't. Um, stress enough how well these kids are behaved um it's a real good group this year where our team building stuff's just been just been amazing so uh you know they're 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 nervous i can tell we just had our pregame meal and and they're pretty nervous to get going so uh, yeah we're gonna head to the rink right away and give her all we have time to drop the puck uh, hey just before we go I mean, obviously you're focused right now on the uh, under 16 uh, boys who were playing in this event the whl cup a couple of weeks here, uh, under 18 women, which is a very, very important program for Hockey Manitoba. Get ready for, uh, what is it, Nationals? The Nationals, yeah, in Dawson Creek, yeah. So they'll, they'll be heading out. Our equipment will come back, be be cleaned up and, and reloaded for uh, for our female our U18 team to head to Dawson Creek. So that's the National Championships. Um, they have teams from the four Western branches, two teams from Ontario, Quebec, and then a team from Team Atlantic. So... Uh, an 18 national championship that leads to the, the the under 18 national team. So it's another real important opportunity for our female girl uh, players to you know, show their abilities as well at the national stage. So exciting times at our branch all the time, Hess. Well, and for sure, and just on the way out, uh, be a big partnership with the Manitoba Moose, which I'm sure has had a lot of work going on behind the scenes and exciting for uh, both parties, I'm sure. Yeah, we we've always had a great relationship with them. You know, they've they've hosted minor hockey nights with us in Hockey Winnipeg, and that they're always you know they're they're such great partners. And along with the Jets, they've been they've been great with uh, you know everything we do as an organization. And 
really proud to, to you know, officially have a sponsorship deal with them and looking forward to a lot of stuff that we're going to uh, work on with them in the future, provide our, our members some, you know, some discounts and get them to some games because it's a great, great product on the ice. Yeah, and folks, you can find out more information on that at the Hockey Manitoba website and, of course, at moosehockey.com, the Moose website. Uh, it's time to get on the bus and go win some hockey games. Uh, good luck. Uh, drop the puck and uh, all the best to uh, the young Manitobans representing our province at the WHL Cup, Bernie. You betcha. Appreciate it. We're going to give her all we have, man. Good stuff. There it is. Bernie Reichart along with Team Manitoba heading out to Red Deer for the uh, WHL Cup and uh, lots going on at Hockey Manitoba. Again, just get to HockeyManitoba.ca if you want more information on it. But a uh, nice spread of players on both the men's and the women's teams from uh, both Winnipeg and uh, the rest of the province. And uh, it's always nice to catch up with Bernie and get the latest on uh, what's happening at the grassroots level. Um, and obviously the Moose and Hockey Manitoba working together. I mean, that really is what uh, what it's all about when it comes to grassroots hockey. Good stuff with uh, with Bernie. Um, all right, a couple things to get to before we finish up the program, including the lines for tonight's game over at Coolbet. Um, kind of a slow night tonight in the National Hockey League, Green, with only two games, both from the Eastern Conference. Yeah, this NHL schedule has, like, there was so, like, Tuesday traditionally has a ton of games. So it was great. Came home, I watched the end of, uh, with that Vegas, Vegas, Dallas, Colorado. Uh, was playing as well. They're off to a great start. Carolina, San Jose. Um, and now tonight, at least they're not at the same time, Huss. So when they're an inter- one's an intermission, you can watch the other. But we have yeah, Washington at Ottawa at 6 and 6.30 Pittsburgh at Detroit. So only two games tonight. That's okay. I can, I'll can. i make a nice video of uh, you talking about attendance for the first 30 minutes of the show. Apparently that's... More of a hot. No one wants to talk about the game, but we can talk about <laughs> attendance. But we all we hope it gets uh, improved tomorrow. We'll have to see. But yeah, two games tonight, and I well, guess listen. The best, yeah. the best part of last night, you know, very clearly was um, was the WHC crew getting together. And again, we, uh, you know, and I know, you know, when we thought about doing this, we were wondering whether there would be people that you know would be uh, into it. And uh, listen, the uh, the support we get never ceases to amaze me. And uh, yes. oh man, it was so much fun at the beginning of the program and even throughout the game. I mean, to be there with friends and people that, and the uh, friends that have been made through the chat at the game was uh, was just great to see. Um, but as I said, you know, I mean, uh, right off the bat, I mean, the, 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 the crowd was really, really concerning. And this is something that, I mean, I don't think this conversation is going away anytime soon. Um, and again, you know, when you get past that home opener on a, on a season, you know, when you're working in pro hockey where there's 41 games, often those early games at the beginning of the season in the middle of the week are some of the most difficult games to fill. If you've got a healthy season ticket base, it's not an issue. People have committed, they're supporting the team, you know, throughout the year. Um, but man, you lose that scarcity, the ticket, you lose a bunch of those season ticket holders and you get to where we are last night. So yeah, that was a big, big part of the uh, conversation today on the program. And, of course, the other part of last night was, uh, you know, a tough loss to L.A., a really bad injury to Gabe Velarde. Thankfully, it is not the longest of long-term injuries, but it's certainly not short-term. Uh, sprain MCL, I believe it's been diagnosed. And we're looking into, um, we're looking into uh, about another four to six weeks. We'll hear from Rick Bonus right away. We've got the audio coming in. Just before we get to Bones to finish off the program, though, as I mentioned, there are two games tonight. You get to the cool bit lines. Ottawa, minus 175 home favorite against Washington. Figured they'd be favored. A little surprised it's that big of a number. Uh, and then the other game, we got Pittsburgh and the Detroit Red Wings going at it. Pittsburgh, a minus 130 favorite. Detroit's had a pretty nice start. The, uh, coming off back-to-back wins. Plus 110 home dog tonight are the Detroit Red Wings. Uh, now moving over to Major League Baseball. Max Scherzer's back tonight for the Rangers, Reem. The Astros have to win this game tonight to avoid going down 3 nothing. We've seen some weird sweeps. We've seen some teams that look good going uh, right out the other way. 
I have to think that the Astros get this done tonight. Uh, now that number's gone down to plus 110. And we haven't seen Scherzer on the mound in about a month and a half. But he's back with how far the Rangers have advanced in these playoffs. Yeah, Texas leading the series 2 nothing, And I think, you know, if you're a Texas fan, they got in a bit of a slump there at the end. But they seem to have heated up again. Scherzer last seen at what? <laughs> the division series clinch party where they were pouring beer into each other's mouth. Scherzer are very fired up after not having pitched in that. So he's back. Shocking to see, not, maybe not shocking, but surprising to see Astros as underdogs as they've been such a powerhouse over the last couple of years. And yeah, there is baseball on tonight and the NLCS uh, returns tomorrow with the Phillies just hitting bomb after bomb. And they look like a team of destiny. Uh, the Phillies, but the Rangers or Astros will have something to say. And I guess the D-backs as well, that series. Not over. You got two 2-0 series leads in the AL and LCS. Hey, just quickly on the Phillies. Mm. I, I'll be honest. I, I think I probably am more familiar with Robin's music than I would think. Like, if you asked me a song by Robin, I wouldn't be able to pick her over a police lineup. I wouldn't know. But actually digging a little bit more, plenty of hits. But that dancing on my own song, the victory song for Philly, great song, really cool to see everybody sing it after they win, but definitely maybe the most bizarre win song I can remember in sports. I have no idea how it started, where it came from. Maybe Philly is just a bit of a weird, weird sports market, but there's a lot of play on that song coming on right now because of what the Phillies are doing, and I have no idea where it came from. Yeah, I mean, that's the recipe to a winner. We had Gloria with the St. Louis Blues propelling them and the Phillies. I didn't even know. I just know that they've had, um, what's it called? Kyle Schwarber and Nick Castellanos hitting bombs, Bryce Harper. You know, we talk a lot about LeBron living up to the impossible hype. I think Bryce Harper, you know, was very touted at like 16 years old or something on the cover of Sports Illustrated. He's what just turned 31. Uh, he's been I I this Robin like show me love Robin oh yeah, it yeah is. I think I think it's R O B Y N yeah wow Swedish pop singer I I mean honest ass like I is that I I must be way out of the loop on the baseball because I did not know they were using that as their win song but I'm a big fan of uh, yeah show me love do you know what it takes I forgot about that one so I'm a I'm a Robin guy. <laughs> I like that well, song. So are all the Phillies fans. I got to figure out what my cool bet pick for the play of the day is. We're 2-0 and so far this week. Mm. I think I'm going to ride with the Astros. I think I'm just going to ride with the Astros money line, a little bit of some plus money. Astros get back in the series. We'll see what Scherzer has after being off for a long time. They got Javier on the line, on the mound. He's 1-0 and in the playoffs. 0, 0. 0.00 E. R A. All right, before we go, we do have audio from Rick Bonus. So uh, let's get to it. Um, no doubt the first question for the head coach was going to be, what can he tell us about Gabriel Velarde, who left last night's game with a scary-looking injury to the lower body? Uh, Gabe has a sprained MCL, and he's out four to six weeks. No operation needed. Uh, he'll just get treated every day, but there's no operation, but he's out long-term. Uh, Mason was uh, maintenance. We fully expect Mason to play tomorrow. All right. No surgery needed. Um, four to six week R&R. &R. As I said, Remo, when we first heard this earlier in the program, to be honest, having been at the game last night and watched that replay over and over again and watched how Gabriel Velarde was, although he did get up and get off the ice on his own, but the way he was doing it on one skate... Um, if you would have told me walking out the building that four to six weeks, I would have taken that in a heartbeat because I think the concern was that Velarde might be gone even a longer period. And look, you mentioned Kirby Doc coming off that injury earlier this week that's going to cost him the entire season. I think there was some serious concern that that might be the case for Velarde. Thankfully, that's not. That being said, for the next month plus, the Jets are going to have to figure out a way to get by and win hockey games without number 13, who's been great so far this season. Yeah, and they shuffled up the lines, but I think because what Appleton was out, it seemed like they want to have him on the top line. We'll see what it is. Um, they did ask Bones, has like, could Velarde come early? And here's what he said. I'm just going by what they tell me. 
right? If they tell me four to six, I'm going to say four to six. So. How do you feel for him? I feel terrible for him. Listen, he's a big part of our team, and uh, he, you know he was on the number one line, he number one power play, and he looked good doing it. He worked very hard all summer, and uh, he was a really good fit for for KC and Mark. And it's unfortunate that happened, but that's uh, yeah, something he's had a tough time with injuries. And with this is it for the year, and he comes back, and he'll be a major contributor as the season goes on. All right, so there's Bones on uh, Gabriel Velarde and. I mean, listen, wishful thinking, if he could maybe come back earlier on the timeline. I mean, great news that there's no surgery. But for the time being, starting tomorrow night against the Stanley Cup champs, this Winnipeg Jets team is going to need to figure out how to get it done without Velarde in the lineup. With Velarde out, all sorts of line shuffling last night. As we mentioned, Mason Appleton, an option for the top line, which might surprise some. Um, Rasmus Kapari was in that spot today. Uh, here's Bones on the lines and uh, Kupari skating with uh, with Shifley and with Kyle Connor today. The first solution it looks like you've come up with is to move Rasmus up on the wing there. Why was he the, a good fit to maybe get the first crack? Well, because Mason wasn't on the ice. <laughs> <laughs> You're jumping ahead here. <laughs> Did I not just make it clear? We'll see what we look like in the morning. <laughs> would Nemeskov be some insulation for Cole, or would you consider using him That was one line you'll see tomorrow. So uh, Vladdy will go back to center with Nick, and we'll because uh, they had good chemistry last year. We're not getting enough. We're not creating enough offense with the second line. We're just not. It, it might look good, flashy at times, but there's no consistent offense from coming from that line. So Vladi and Nick had great chemistry at the end of last year, so we're going to give that a go. And you'll play Vladi in the center? Yeah, Vladi will play center, and we'll move Cole back to the wing. All right, so there's Bones. Um, so listen, I mean, <laughs> I guess Kapari is an option. From what we just heard Rick Bonus say, I would be stunned if it wasn't Appleton getting that start. And uh, debate amongst yourselves whether you like that move or not. I guess they do have some other options. I'm sort of with Murad. I think, you know, if they're going to move someone from the bottom six, Nino Niederreiter probably is. Although, I, I, I am really intrigued, especially against a team like Vegas, to see what the Lowry line would look like with Nino and with Ayafalo on it. And from the looks of the lines today and what Bones just had to say, that is probably what we are going to see. Um, there's one more from Vegas. Listen, Connor Hellebuck's had a rough start to the season. I think everyone's got a lot of confidence that Hellebuck will continue to be the Vesna Trophy candidate level goaltender. But that really wasn't the case in the first week. Many people thought, and I think honestly, if this wasn't the Vegas Golden Knights here tomorrow, if it was some other team, I think maybe Brassois goes last night. But often coaches want to give players an opportunity to play against their old team. That'll be the case tomorrow. Here's Bones on uh, Brossois getting the start tomorrow night against the Knights. Well, we, regardless if it was Vegas or not, that was the game we, we, he was going to play. We are going to get uh, Helly in for those first three. And the way the schedule is, there was definitely uh, he was definitely going to play that game. It happens to be Vegas, but that was the game we want to get him in. And we'll get him in again next week as well. You like what you saw, obviously, from him in the preseason and expecting him to just kind of pick right up there? Yep. <laughs> we are. Yeah. And no, listen, you watch him in practice. He was an incredible worker. Everything I heard about him in the summer, he's, he's living up to, like his work habits, his, uh, being a good teammate, being great around the room and everything. He's, he's everything we heard of. I heard about him. These guys obviously know him a lot better than I do, but uh, he, he's done a great job for us in, so far. And now we need, he needs to play some games. Well, so much for my thoughts on maybe in a different situation. Bro would have gone in game number three. Not according to the head coach. It was going to be Helly for the first three. It's Brassois this week, or, you know, this start. And then one of the games next week. Again, the uh, Jets in Edmonton on Saturday. So uh, certainly looks like Hellebuck's going to get that start against the high-powered Oilers. And then we'll wait to see what happens with the Winnipeg Jets in that 7.45 Tuesday game as part of the uh, Super Tuesday in the National Hockey League. Uh, just before we go, Remo, did you just say into my ear the Chiefs just made a trade? Yeah, they made a trade. Yeah, I was going to start it off by saying the Winne or the Jets have made a trade. The New York Jets with the Chiefs. Uh, Let me, me guess, Mecole Hardman. That's correct, Mecole Hardman back to the Chiefs. With Chiefs, they don't like any of the receivers. 
going to with uh, what works. I thought Rasheed Rice has been good. I picked him up in uh, two fantasy leagues, but it's, uh, what is it, late round pick swap. Uh, trying to figure out. It just uh, Adam Schefter saying 2025 seventh to the Chiefs for a 2025 sixth. And for the Jets taking seventh and Hardman for a sixth. Okay, so uh, Jets basically just, or Jet, they they had, uh, it hadn't been working with me, Cole Hardman. I think he'd been a little disgruntled. He now gets to go back to Kansas City and catch passes from Patrick Mahomes, and I think there's a very good argument to be made that there's more balls to be had for a guy like Hardman, because with the exception of Rashi Rice, who is definitely trending upwards. MVS hasn't done much. Justin Watson got hurt last week, and he's been pretty good, but, I mean, a pretty replacement-level guy. Yeah. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how that works. Chiefs taking on the Chargers coming up on uh, coming up on uh, Saturday, on Sunday afternoon. And uh, what actually, one other NFL note that we talked about in the lock shop, Nathan Rourke's been uh, activated and moved to the 53-man roster for the Jacksonville Jaguars. I've think the belief is that Trevor Lawrence is going to play and getting back to the cool bet lines that line was three yesterday for New Orleans it's now one and that would certainly indicate more optimism that Trevor Lawrence will be able to go if he can't go though um listen I know they've got Beathard as the backup but I think that's more in supporting Lawrence throughout games be pretty cool to see Nathan Rourke get a little bit of a shot against the Saints in the Dome if that happens. But needless to say, option A for the Jags is to play their former number one overall picking, Trevor Lawrence. Yeah, I mean, a lot of people in chat saying, hey, Nathan Rourke's in, and uh, Lawrence, he's kind of, I don't know if he's like broken out like you thought it would. He's definitely capable of those big games. But what is this classic NFL Jags Thursday night football? Hey, I'll, I'll be just, watching. It's just the fact that they're not playing the Titans or the Texans in usually what is the TNF Super Bowl of the year from the AFC mm. South is is a crime. But considering how mediocre the Saints have been so far this year, so bad. It'll make it. It'll make an interesting uh, game to uh, to get going. Um, I should mention uh, as well. Speaking of the Bombers, though, CFL lines are out. The Bombers have opened as eleven point favorites against the Elks. Huge, huge spreads this week. Bombers 11 point favorites against the Elks. The Riders are nine point home dogs to the Toronto Argonauts and are playing for their lives. If they lose this game, Remo, all Calgary has to do is either beat BC this week or beat Winnipeg in a game that they may not be playing their starters and the Riders will miss the playoffs and for the second year in a row not win a game after Labor Day. Yeah, it hasn't gone great for the Riders, but and there are certainly some big spreads. This is a weird time of the year for CFL, has, as you said. A number of teams have clinched. Like the Argos haven't played. I mean, they're nine point favorites, but they haven't really played. They're you know needed to win for weeks. Uh, BC, they got. I mean, uh, Hamilton took them for a run last week. Calgary, I don't know what to expect from them, and you hope the Bombers can win and lock it down and get that extra, you know, extra week of rest. Um, you know, for the bye, but also next week, I'm assuming they wouldn't play a lot of their starters. However, that Dalton show news from Ted, not ideal. You don't want to hear that, but we do know the one, there's one area the Bombers are deep at, it is receiver, but I mean, Dalton show is one of the best in the league. Like that's tough to replace. They're going to need him in November. Take the, all the time you need right now, Dalton, just to hopefully you can be uh, good to go come the 11th of November when the Bombers are uh, hopefully playing for a trip to the Grey Cup at IG Field against, in all likelihood, the British Columbia Lions. Although we'll see who between Calgary and Saskatchewan ends up making it to the playoffs to begin. Calgary in a bit of the driver's seat, especially if the Riders lose this game to Toronto on the weekend. Uh, that's going to do it for us, gang. Once again, shout out and thanks to everyone that joined us for our first WST night. Hopefully the game against the Oilers in November will be a little bit better game and a few more asses in the seats. This will be something we'll be following on Winnipeg Sports Talk. We look forward to having somebody join us from the organization on Friday. I think the plan is to do that. Tomorrow on the show, Ken will be on, Brandon as well. We'll have plenty of talk about the Jets as to how they manage without Gabriel Velarde going forward uh, and plenty coming out of the room after tomorrow's morning skate. That is going to do it for us. 
Thanks to everyone that came out last night. Many of you back with us in chat today. Thanks to all the podcast listeners and everyone that popped by and said hi to the crew last night. We will look forward to firing it up again tomorrow for a game day edition of Winnipeg Sports Talk live at 1 p.m. right here on YouTube. Thanks again to the sponsors that make this show happen each and every day. And most of all, all of you for making Winnipeg Sports Talk a part of yours. We'll see you tomorrow at 1, everybody. Have a great night. Oh, my God. Shut it down. Let's go home. Thanks for tuning in to Winnipeg Sports Talk Daily. Make sure to subscribe on YouTube and your favorite podcast feed at winnipegsportstalk.com.